Well, good afternoon, gentlemen. I want to thank all three of you for your time today. I know time is valuable. We're here at the 46th annual IPMI conference in beautiful Orlando, Florida. To my right, we have Mr. Oliver Creston of Hensel Recycling. Thank you, Oliver, for being here. Steve Contreras with PGM of Texas. And Mr. Lee Hockey, he's independent consultant and also the current president of the IPMI European chapter. So thank you for your time as well, Lee. So today we have board members of the IPMI and a big topic that is... Past president. And a past president. That's right. Don't want to forget that, Oliver. But a big topic is catalytic converter theft. And I know you guys are all on the committee, so I thought maybe we could uh, just ask a few questions and you guys can enlighten us and update us on status and what's, what's happening in that sector. So if uh, I'd be like my to perspective, start. our yeah. industry perspective, um, I know that we view things differently than a couple of other organizations, don't we, Steve? Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you want to say about that? Uh, about the other organizations? Or? No. No? Yeah. <laughs> about our, our perspective. Yeah, no, it's, uh, if, you, if, if you look at the past two years uh, from the industry, there's been approximately 130 laws passed across, uh, across the United States. There's another 49 new laws that are introduced, being introduced to the new legislative session at this time. Um, all various versions to to stop catalytic converter theft. On a state level. At a state level. And then you still have some that are being passed as by counties and municipalities as mm -hmm. well. So it's uh, it's really affected, all this new regulation, uh, regulations affected uh, uh, all, our, all our businesses, along with the metal pricing and the semiconductor issues. So it's challenging, it is. Yeah, it is challenging. Definitely. It is. Are we? We're we're looking as an organization to try to address this on a federal level. You think that's a good approach? Uh, speaking with lobbyists, I, I think it is. When you talk to them, it's uh, um, the catalytic converter was introduced and at a federal level by the EPA to control emissions. Uh, when we're looking at what we're trying to do at a position, we take we stand with the, with the catalytic converter theft. Is one we're looking at. Uh, to help stop there would be no cash payments. And not only no cash payments, is no cash receiving from the seller. So it's very important that you look at it from those two, two standpoints. Uh, and if you look at interstate commerce, which is federal, you could, we could do something at that level with interstate commerce to, to make it, you know, um, stop the, the cash I think we see that, and it, it's effective in Europe. It's, you've seen that in the Not Europe market. Not that effective, but at least it, it's a way to, to stop it. Yeah. Uh, we have in the, in the committee, we have like two points where we, where we handle that, that issue. Uh, it's one is the federal law or the laws in the states, in the United States, where in Europe, we're more looking on, on compliance and, and know your customer due diligence. Uh, AML, from, from any AML, money laundering. No, yeah name it AML, Compliance. but it's, it's much more, you know, it should be from the, the organizations around us, like the, the LPPM, LBMA, they have their responsible sourcing guidelines, they don't want to get any, starting from the uh, mining, child labor protection things, but it's also going into, into recycling, you have to have good, right. good sourcing practices. Um, the IPA, the International Platinum Association, that's where all the mining companies and the, the big refineries are in there. They, they will not have or don't want to have stolen material in their process that they maybe sell into the jewelry market. You know, it's a little bit like that, that ethical standpoint. And so that, that's, that's in Europe, we don't need new laws. We have a lot of laws in place, but, but it's more like all the players, starting from the big smelters, refiners, through the processors, collectors, they should really do a proper due diligence. And, and one is not paying cash, don't deal with individuals, do background That's checks, make, make awareness to scrapyards, door note, because they also buy from individuals, you know. Ideally, you buy a car with a converter, that's it. But if you get somebody coming and offers you five converters, be aware that could be fakes, it could be stolen, they could be whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, yeah, so that, that's what we handle at that committee. Yeah, it's, uh, this re it's responsible sourcing is 
good delivery. You mm -hmm. want to make sure you're delivering good good material. Yeah. yeah. And we started to see that being affected. Is that, you know, that's basically the gold and silver. It's, but we're starting to see that to, to affect the PGMs. And uh, that's one thing that's, that's another thing we're working on as IPMI. We're looking, working on uh, putting together these uh, guidelines for responsible sourcing and good delivery. And uh, Lee's been involved in that work. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think if, what people don't realize is that there might be thousands of collectors out there, but the actual ounce, PGM ounce, actually probably ends up at about five to ten companies, really. So it's in their best interest if the LPPM are saying to, say, uh, one of the big refiners, you need to be responsible for sourcing, then they're going to have to push down on everybody else because it's, it's not as though there's hundreds of people out there that you can buy, convert, and get it refined. So I think using that legislation, pushing down the supply chain, um, is, uh, is, a, is the other way to tackle the, the subject so you can do it from both sides. And as you say, in Europe, the, the, most of the legislations are there, so that, that's why we're pulling something together that we can adapt from the LPPM's code of conduct. And Here say, in the US? Yeah. Yeah, yeah for, for the IPMI, producing yeah. a paper, not with consultancy of the LPPM, saying this is the best practice and that's how you should do your due diligence. Uh, and that's that what everybody should, as an IPMI member, sign up to. Let's mm -hmm. call it a code mm -hmm. of conduct or something like that. What about some of the other industry groups that are involved in the catalytic converter supply chain, such as ARA, uh, as maybe the ARA, the auto recyclers that might be buying f converters from the public, or maybe recyclers of scrap metal that are buying, that's their business model from the public? Yeah, it's... Uh yeah, and that's where you, you talked about the uh, other entities are getting involved in this. What they started, Isri is one that's highly involved, and they started this in 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they at state levels with their network of of uh, members and lobbyists. That's they've had their their hands in a lot of the laws that have been written. And on it's geared more level. toward mm -hmm. keeping the converter on the car to take, for example, Connecticut. Uh, passed a law where you, you, it's illegal to remove a converter from a car. It has to be sold with the car. That's and recently. It's recently, right. And it's, it's uh, you know, what does that do for recycling? Uh, I was in a Senate committee meeting in the state Senate committee in Texas, and it just it made me realize that these lawmakers didn't understand the need for a recycling catalytic converter. And, you know, it's like, why don't we just make a law that it's illegal to have a catalytic converter? Not you knowing know, the not repercussions knowing that affect it, all of us in this room. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it goes beyond that. It's the strategic metal strategic materials. Metal. Well, look it, at the Biden administration that named platinum already. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. you yeah, you look hard. at the uh, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, and the Department of Geological Services. Uh, you know, if you look at the 30, uh, 35 uh, critical elements. You know, and the, they call it PGEs, which mm -hmm. platinum group elements, right. which is a PGMs of uh, platinum, palladium, rhodium, right. iridium, right. ruthenium, and, and uh, osseum. Uh, so, yeah, they're, they're, it's we want to keep that in the United States because it's critical to our uh, defense. It's critical because we don't mine it very much. Yeah. So, and if you look at mining, that's an interesting point. You look at mining, it takes about almost 800 pounds of ore and rock to produce enough PGMs for one catalytic converter. And if you look at what in the US, we we uh, decommission about 40 million catalytic converters a year. So you, you do that, multiply that by 800 pounds, just think of how much mining it takes to get for yeah. that one. Just think of the energy cost involved with that. The energy cost. And there's a CO2 footprint. CO2 CO2 footprint. It just goes on and on and on. Yeah. Yeah. That's what Matt Watson was just discussing with us right. earlier. Yeah, yeah. They, and CO2 they don't realize. You know, it, 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 that was an eye opener for the the legislators when we, we brought that up to them. That, uh, yeah, because they don't know that. They don't know that. And no. it, you know, they have to understand the, uh, the importance of recycling. Yeah, and the interesting one on that is is that I think North America is quite good at uh, the recycling and the mining in North America. You know, quite a size self-sustaining environment for the palladium usage. I mean, just imagine if you didn't have recycling with the Ukraine-Russian issue, where all the palladium come from, and you didn't have all that recycling in North America of PGMs to supply, what would have happened then? The palladium price would have been 
yeah. out of the roof. But it's only you have so much ounces being recycled in North America, it can resupply the new the new demand for the catalytic converters. Well, I think the member com- uh, companies of IPMI uh, really, when you when you look at it, we've got all the supply chain from mining to fabricating to recycling uh, for all the different products that are consumed in the economies and, and and we as a you know as a collective membership group of companies have a a full view of what's occurring here not just an industry specific view of uh, well this is what our industry requires or needs to thrive but we we really need to focus on sustainability in all in all of these uh, you know platinum group metals silver and gold as well uh, in the supply chain and we always have been focused on that in the IPMI even even 40 years ago when I first cut my teeth in the precious metals industry we didn't use the term sustainability or ESG or circular economy these are all buzzwords today (laughs) now we're all using these buzzwords but we've been involved in this for years and years and years and I think that as an industry group collective, we have a, a much better understanding of, of all of these issues that, that Steve was just bringing up. Yeah, and you know, and and that's you know, we're looking at this as you brought that up earlier about it, the committee mm-hmm. that we have for uh, auto catalyst theft in the IPMI. Uh, for our position, you know, it's, we're looking at no cash, and we're also looking at a. Uh, there, do again. This is uh, hopefully we'll do all this through lobbying. If everybody agrees to, for federal, the, the, the federal bill that's, inter- that's being introduced to Congress <coughs> now, uh, it's the you know a license, whether you call it a catalytic converter license or a or a uh, PGM license or wh- whatever you want to call it, um, and that's the work, and that would help out law enforcement. The biggest issue you have with law enforcement is if they stop somebody with catalytic converter say at three o'clock in the morning and they have 10 catalytic converters in their car they have a chop saw and they have a floor jack okay the guy looks guilty but i have no report of any catalytic converters were stolen because it's three o'clock in the morning the cars they stole them all people are still asleep you know haven't been reported yet so they they can't do anything uh, and it goes back to where the legislators were talking about why should people have colored converters in their possession. Well, if we have this federal license and we make it where it's there's some difficulty to get it, not just anybody can get it like you can your MRE license or your secondary scrap license or your mm-hmm. auto mm-hmm. Uh, uh, parts yeah. result, yeah, yeah. this amount or things like that. And you made it somewhat difficult, or make it where you have to have a brick and mortar location. You you know you pay a, a premium price on an annual basis. Law enforcement can pull that person over and say, "Oh, you have catalytic converters. Okay. Let me see your catalytic converter license." Right. And instantly, if they don't have it, they can press charges against them. If they do have it, then they still have their information and they can let them go. That well, was simple scrapper's that, license won't do. Right, and they're so and it's, it's so inexpensive as well. I mean, at hundred dollars, you can go get your license, and anybody can do that. Uh, so that, that's another thing we're looking at doing. So I like to hear some of the numbers from your guys' perspective. Um, how many are being stolen in the United States? Any idea? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. In in two thousand twenty, it was uh, less than uh, fourteen thousand. About two, forty million. Out of forty million, being recycled. Well, it's even more than that. That's the recycling the car side. Car park is two hundred plus million, I would say. Yeah, how many cars do we have on the street? Yeah, <laughs> registered vehicles in the United States is two hundred ninety-one million as of twenty twenty-two. And there's more than one converter per vehicle average, correct? It's two to four, so we say an average of two point five converters. And then you have they're, they're estimating that seventeen million vehicles will be decommissioned end of life this year. So. That comes up to about seven hundred and fifty million, seven hundred thousand. That's a big number of catalytic sure. converters yeah, that's that, a big number. that are available, and you know, and it's less than less than thirty thousand converters were stolen. So your percentage is infinitesimal. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's, it's it's a lot of in the media because it 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 hurts an individual person that is converted, gets stolen. He has to his all the 
the hassle with getting replaced and that and the same as in Germany we, we don't even get data the insurance companies don't don't track it so a stolen converter is like a stolen car part we have no numbers we, we think it's maybe in the below 5,000 but we also have 40 million cars on the street so the percentage is it's, it's a lot in the media because it's really a problem for these people that get careless stolen. It costs thousands of dollars to replace. Cost some, but for the insurance companies it's maybe not the police they don't bother really you know there is once in a while they then do something so what, what we try is really to bring it to attention that that this recycling industry is important but we are not you know when you get asked what do you do recycling catalytic converters oh you take all the stolen stuff no we don't and that you know that recycling is important but we are not that that's not right who we have, are right. that's not what we want and nobody wants it and that's no. where we take this committee to, to prepare a, yeah, a best practice that everybody is in the same boat and, and works. I think education, education is important, is important. Uh, yeah. for the industry and for lawmakers. It is, yeah. and, and that's where, uh, as a company, as PGM Texas, we, we've we actually uh, hired a consultant. Uh, he's retired. His name was uh, Chief Art Acevedo. He's a retired chief officer from Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. so retired chief, he retired, our, our, he was also ex-chief for uh, Houston, Texas, and then for Miami, Florida. So he's been chief of police, you know, as a chief for all his career. He said a career. few things. So, yeah. <laughs> so we use him to to, uh, to go out and talk to law enforcement and train them on who we are and everything. And we bring law enforcement into our facilities to say, this is what we do. And they don't realize the technology that goes into processing the catalytic converters. That's right. And it's, you know, and it is an eye opener for them. And it, you know, and they do, you know, we want to let them know that we want to be part of the solution, that we're not the problem. So, I think that goes for all of us at the table. I mean, absolutely. We've, we've talked with law enforcement and helped them and, you know, share with them, look, we're transparent. We do everything above board. We have our AML. We know our customers. We don't buy from the public. So We don't pay cash. We've never paid cash. <laughs> so Yeah, and that's important. It is. And the cash part is, 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 a, is a hurdle as well because... Cash is still legal tender in the United yeah, States. That's right. And a lot, I mean, you can go buy a new car and pay cash. You know, if you have $50,000, you can do it. And it's, so it's being a legal tender is still, it's hard. But it's something that since it's, this is media driven and it's, and it's, you know, it's also felt by states, uh, departments, because a lot of uh, state vehicles have been hit as well with, you know, stolen. Uh, had their you know, they have their fleets. They have their fleets exactly, and that's and that's uh, you know that's where part of it is driven, especially in Texas, where they had almost thirty Toyota Priuses hit at one time. <laughs> oh my so, gosh! You know, so it, it it is painful, you know, at, at a personal and 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 a and a fleet level as well. I just wanted to add some other topic. We were talking about the IPMI, and you said that we have the whole supply chain in here. And, yes. And catalytic converter theft is is something that really is for the whole supply chain. You know, catalytic mm -hmm. converter manufacturers get the stuff stolen on the way to the car companies. That's right. Yeah. Um, so that you we look at the, this. We have the security committee at the IPMI or security council meeting. Mm -hmm. and, and they always report that, especially South Africa, you know, that they, they hijack trucks with. Mm -hmm. monolith bricks on the way to, to the car manufacturing site. Um, we are, as uh, recyclers, we get stuff stolen during transport, you know, right. uh, oh, scrap oh. yards. It's happened get, to all they, of us. In scrap yard, they come in at night and mm -hmm. stole the, the box. They'll take the it market. off the LTL trucks that we should. Yeah, so yeah. It's not, not only the car, the individual person, that it's really the whole, everybody in the IPMI who's involved in that business, from manufacturing to transportation, insurance, you know. Mm -hmm. We had just, when we got, we had, we had talking pounds, 4,000 pounds stolen from a truck last year or during a transport in right. Europe. Right. So it's for the insurance, it's a hassle, you know? For, yeah, it is. For our side security and then yeah. it's a lot of, lot of things. It's hard to get insurance for that product. We know we've gone through it several times. We've had loads stolen as well. Um, and it, it it's a big issue. It's, it's funny. I think that there's a lot of organized crime that's involved with it on multiple levels. I th uh, you know at the say at a depot mm -hmm. where where your materials offloaded and then put onto another truck and somehow in the depot something happens. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get scanned. They can't find it on the floor any longer. And yeah, now, now we come to the point that Lee raised all that stuff. If it's stolen from cars, from us, from 
manufacturers. manufacturers. There is only five refiners in the world that process PGMs, mm -hmm. right? So, so it, it will it will point. end up it will end up there, and yeah. that we as an industry must protect ourselves to to get that out. These yeah, guys, yeah, I mean, know, just imagine if one of those failed an LPPM accreditation because of uh, an issue to do with when that capacity goes out of the market, then they look there, it's just, that's it's, a, yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's a, an industry really. That's a huge loss in yeah. yeah, I was thinking about uh, that very issue that there's so few uh, smelters and wet chemistry operations to recycle this material, and all that stolen material ends up in multiple hands throughout the supply chain, and it ends up coming back somehow mixed in with legitimate material. And what we're discussing here is how do we tighten that up so that we could squeeze it out? Yeah, and that's that's another thing we're, you know they're looking at too is uh, with all this legislation that's being passed in the U.S., one thing that keeps coming up is having the VIN numbers on catalytic converters. Now, we all know that's not gonna stop theft. I mean, give you some numbers, in 2020, over 810,000 vehicles were stolen. Yeah, didn't in the stop US. from stealing my car. <laughs> I guarantee you, every one of them had a VIN number. <laughs> right. you know? Of course. And you look at more, put the numbers in more perspective, there was 40,000 just F-150 trucks stolen. That was still more than the count converter stolen in that year. Right. You know? We right. all have VIN numbers. And, and they had VIN numbers, and, but we didn't hear a cry of, hey, we no. need to do something about the theft of F-150 trucks, right. you know? So maybe if we add another VIN number, <laughs> but, yeah. spray it on the roof, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> see it from a helicopter. <laughs> but uh, but that's a good but point. But that that's a good up. point you yeah. bring up because there's all these issues, and there are other things that people are not even looking at, like this mm -hmm. topic, right? Well, they, and they look at that and they go, yeah, but it, it's it, you know, will it stop theft? Uh, no, but what they're looking at is who's buying the stolen converters. And that's where that puts that strength, the, the, the not strength, but the, the, the strain on our supply chain because right. it's the regulation of. Right. Now you have to record these numbers, which is fine. We're going to do whatever it takes because we're we're a big company. We're going to do whatever law says because we're law abiding. You know, now you have to hold this material for so many days. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I think Nevada they have a law if you have a certain license, you have to hold it for 30 days. Mm -hmm. You know, so well, second, just hand imagine, second hand dealer's license. Yeah, just just imagine that and what it does for you is for hedging and and right. and you know and, and then what the market does in thirty Cash days. Flow. Yeah. yeah, so just imagine that what that forces does. the company to pay less for the, a spread for the risk to yeah. protect the yeah. risk, yes. yeah. and that's, that's not healthy in the market either. No, and what we see come back to law enforcement is in the UK we see a good approach that the joint forces between the EPA, so environmental agency the HRMS, which is your IRS tax people involved, and the police. And they, they go for illegal scrap yards and they're looking, you know, and drying the system out. You know, they really go there, search the, the property, and you know, if you don't have a permit, if you don't have this and that and that, just they shut you down, take you out of business. And they go, I think, also go to eBay and things like that. And just I was going to bring together. that up. I was going to ask media, about you know, that. Selling catalytic on Facebook or eBay or whatever. Okay. Yeah, social yeah. media, yeah. 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 We, we've and done I, blogs on that very topic. No, no, and, you, and I believe Bad wrote a wrote a good piece on that. It, I've got a lot of uh, heat for it, we but, got, we, I, but and, I still put it out there. And being <laughs> being PGM, we got a lot of heat from that too. <laughs> but having the PGM name, right. but uh, no, I mean it is true. You do see that, and you know it's one thing we tell law enforcement. They're starting to look at. At Facebook. And, yeah, we and, have to educate and, them. That's what and, I was saying. You know, it's like I was so frustrated. I said, just put it out there. So they have, you know, they do. They advertise. I'm going to be in this, you know, this state or this here, you know, and mm -hmm. you know, and and they do that. Uh, I remember uh, one of the uh, the members, board members for ARA. She uh, uh, got on Facebook and just started. You know, hey, let me see what these guys are doing. And she replied, said, "I have catalytic converters." You know, oh yeah. And she goes, "Well, do you, are you licensed?" And, you know, and you know, and they were like, "No answer." No answer. Or yes, I have a license. What kind? They couldn't answer driver's what license. kind of license. Yeah. I have a driver's that. license. Yeah, yeah. 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 you know, <laughs> and the things that you know, are you licensed to sell? Right yeah, here. I, exactly. I, I so I mean, you know, it's but I mean, it was that simple. Yeah. You know, it was that it, simple to get on there. I think it also 
shows now going forward with all these legislation chains and this autocat theft thing is that I think the role the IPMI needs to play is, is the interaction with other organisations. Mm -hmm. I think it's becoming crucial. It's like when we met with uh, ISRI, uh, they were talking about car catalyst theft and they were going in a completely different direction to where the IPMI wanted to go. And therefore, we could run the risk of uh, getting something legislatively put forward because somebody else has put it forward rather than having our own interests put forward. And I think it's going forward, I think this inter-collaboration with a lot of other organisations for the IPMI is going to be a very crucial role that we need to play <coughs> with the LPPM, with ISRI, with all these people. So we've got a collective voice uh, in the industry rather than yeah. everybody doing their own thing. So that's, that's one thing we're, we're, we're doing with the, with the committee who's uh, our, in our, our meeting tomorrow at 1.30 is we're having a uh, we, we received a proposal from uh, a federal lobbyist out of dc they're coming to present their their proposal to us uh we have a, a position of what we want to do and and that's with no cash federal license uh, if there is vin number tracking then it's done at time of entry into the supply chain which means if a, uh, a car gets scrapped and it goes to the automotive uh, a recycler then they which by the way they're already tracking parts through VIN numbers so they, they do that already so uh, it's already be an done. extra step it, now well, for the converter then well they still do that yeah. they still do it. every time they take a part or anything whatever that core is that comes off of that car they 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 input it they, into a they put it into a system in the database and they and it ties back to that VIN number so they know that where this core went right. or Calic converter they know that it would came off of this car so they're already doing that if it's entered into the supply chain by buying at the door then a, a core company or or a Calic converter recycler will enter it at that time into the database into the database if it's done at an auto repair shop or at a dealership when that converter enters the supply chain chain then that's when it would be recorded or ends up at the buyer's door or at the buyer's door exactly and but not who the buyer sells to right no but you know when when you come up along the supply chain of the, the big processes collectors like pjm or hensel we cannot record 20,000 wind numbers a day or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's impossible. No, it, and it's possible to, to track the what converters went into a 2,000 pound super sack of catalysts. You know, and that, that question was brought up by Isri. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? You know, my response is uh, it's, everything's possible, but what it's going to take to do that. You know, it well, they don't to. have a perspective on the precious metal recycling sector that we have as an industry group at IPMI. I'll give you a great example. Um, secondhand dealers or pawn shops, they're licensed to record serial numbers on 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 watches, as an example. A gold watch comes in and say it's uh, just a common 50s, 60s Hamilton gold watch. It's got a serial number on it. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to buy that watch. It sits in their showcase eventually. But they've, they've, they've reported the serial number. It wasn't stolen. It was inherited, was liquidated to the secondhand dealer for cash. They can't sell it as jewelry or a watch. So they pop the movement out and they send it to the refinery to get paid for gold. So it goes into the supply chain. It's already been reported. It wasn't stolen, right? Mm hmm it's not necessary for the refiner to, again, re report that serial number before they melt it down and refine the gold. Right. I think it's the only so, way, you know, it's, once it's the converter is in its can, that's the only way, the way it can trace it. How, right. Once it's cut. It's, it's like it's, melting that watch down into a ingot. The identity is no longer there. Yeah. Well, and the, and the other thing, too, with the, with the VIN numbers, everyone, you know, knows that well, you're in California, we're in Texas, but when you get up into the Northeast or Northwest, how do you, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. how does that work? You know, because the numbers rust off. They rust off. Uh, and then if uh, and a, a thief could be clever, you know, he can grind a number off. I think, you know, so it, it's, it's hard to do that. And I don't think, I think there's a big push against that for the manufacturer. Well, this is an issue that's going to be with us for a few years. How long do you think it might take us to get through a federal uh, push for legislation? Several years? 
Uh, no, I mean, I, I, it, it's it's hard to say. You know, you got a new, um, uh, you, you know, in January 1, you'll have a new Congress, mm-hmm. a new Senate, mm-hmm. and it just depends on who picks it up and, and runs with it. But if this theft continues, you can see that this could actually pick up legs and, and yeah. move quickly. Well, the theft will always be there. It always has been there. It just happens to be a media issue, in my my view, because the the numbers of, of reported thefts or, or thefts are so low against how many are actually entering the supply chain on an annual basis. So it's it's really hyped. That that it's that's it is. I agree, hundred percent. But the other part of that too is is nowadays you're seeing legislators where, you know, my granddaughter's converter was stolen. Or my neighbor's converter was stolen. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it's it's, so it's, it's getting home. closer to yeah. home. So there's, there, you know, they they feel it. It wasn't necessarily theirs was stolen, but they're they're feeling it, and, that, and that's that's where the, the push is, is is coming from. And we want to we want to get I, I don't get ahead, get of, ahead of it, maybe, get, get but we definitely mm-hmm. we want to be part of that solution, and that's what we're trying to do as an industry. I think that's healthy. So what yeah. you know, the other thing we're doing as a committee is, you know. If, if we go that route with the uh, with the lobbyists on the federal for federal bill to be passed is and that's what's so great about the IPMI with this supply chain that we have you know of collectors processors smelters refiners you know traders banks finance banks, banks, banks and finance yes. so all avenues <laughs> they, it, so it's, it's it's we're able to prob- to form a coalition right and it's an industry with the industry itself that's right. doing something, right. you know, to get behind some kind of legislation. And it's not a organization like ISRI, or it's not an organization like IPMI that's making this push. Well, it's not industry specific. It's, exactly. Like ISRI. Right. I, you know, I was thinking about this as you three were discussing the issues. I was thinking, boy, the IPMI really is uniquely positioned to be a lead organization to partner with these other organizations that don't have the the breadth and the depth of the member company's interests in processing, because we we really do uh, have that here. And you know, that kind of brings me to that other topic of the IPMI, which I kind of wanted to bring bring up. And since you are currently Lee, the um, president of the European chapter um, I I would like to um, for people out there that are companies not members currently of IPMI thinking about joining perhaps the organization maybe uh, you could encourage them with uh, your words on why it's important for us to be yeah, members and I think I think going forward it's going to be even more important to be a member I, I see that with all these legislative changes that are happening know your customer uh, conflict minerals all these type of things I think having a network where you can share best practices industry information what's coming down from other organizations to the members is going to be very crucial so in europe one of the first things we did Oliver and myself is we we contacted the ipa the lbmea lppm and said like can we exchange ideas in terms of what where are you going in terms of uh, uh laws and esg and sustainability and we'll share ours uh, and then we can get things like reports that come from those that we can then distribute uh, across the industry so that all of our members know that if there's an issue to do with LPPM saying refiners have to do this, this, this and this you know that it's going to come down the line to you at some point so I, I'm very much of the opinion that, that this networking of an information flow will become more and more crucial um, to the industry and I think that's why I would recommend people to join uh, and, and also feedback what they're finding so we can keep all the members uh, n- know about the current changes in legislation and what to look out for and things like that. Yeah, it's important. I think I think there's a, a great brain trust yeah. that we all draw upon here. Go ahead, well, Steve. the other side to that is we all, we all know that it's going to EVs. Now, it's probably not as soon as they're trying to tell us it's going to get there, but it's heading that way. If you start looking into the battery industry, lithium, they start to recycle the lithium batteries, right. which con- contains precious metals. So eventually it's going to tie the lithium recycling. It's going right. to tie that into the precious metal side. So yes, it's very important that you look at that industry 
and say, yes, you need to become members of IPMI because right. if you're going to recycle these batteries, well, there's precious metals. Yeah, there's, there's, there's hazardous metals in there. Well. Yeah. Well, it's hazardous to treat as well, isn't yeah. it? You can, so the safety aspect of it becomes, becomes strong and that as well, yeah. So I think the collaboration approach is how I see that the IPMI needs to develop, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, absolutely. Like that. And yeah, it's a, it's a perfect organization to, to learn and understand the business. You know, I'm here now since 20 years, almost uh, over 20 years. Um, that's 30 years in the industry, 20 years at going to IPMI conferences, I, I, and I learn every day, even this this actual conference. I was going to ask you this learn, question. Learn new Did stuff. you wake up one morning and say, oh, I'm going to choose a career path in precious metals? <laughs> or how organically did you find your way this into is, this uh, industry? It's a little bit, you know, I, I was born and raised in Hanau. Okay. And Hanau in Germany is uh, where Horaeus is, where Charles Engelhardt was born. Right. Uh, so that's a precious metal city. So okay. my mom worked at Degussa, so I, I did an apprenticeship at Degussa. And then my first job was precious metals recycling. So I started with X-ray films and, and photographic silver. And that's been in the precious metals that's right. since uh, yeah, 32 years now. And wow, that's interesting. And, and, and then in the yeah, early 2000s, I joined the IPMI for a first conference. and. Uh, so it's interesting for, for my side here. the story is that uh, so Royce, John St. Matthews refinery is in Royston mm -hmm. uh, and that's where I was born and if I looked out of my bedroom window I could see the John St. Matthews refinery oh, wow. and like <laughs> the 60% of the people who live in Royston worked at John St. Matthews my dad worked at John St. Matthews my sister worked at John St. Matthews <laughs> so I just went to John St. Matthews it made sense, yeah, right? just to go to John St. Matthews this and is then the third time today I've heard a similar story mm -hmm. I grew up in a town that was associated in the precious metals yep. industry and I found my way in a job. Right. Yeah. Because my family, first job. Family work yeah. there. It's yeah. there. It's how interesting. Do. And then yeah. refining, that was the first thing I did. And refining? 35 years later, I'm still doing it. And as Oliver says, I mean, like, it's, and get I think that's the. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I think it's, it's great to get everybody back together today because start to bounce ideas. So many ideas were thinking around of it. So that's that's a very good thing is to like share ideas and, and, and parts like that. So. How about That's you, Steve? I'm just oh, curious. Uh, it's totally by accident. I was a uh, district manager for a, uh, a skilled labor company. I didn't have a sales rep at the time, so I was making sales calls in, my, in one of my areas. And I saw this building, that, and it had this metal fence around it with barbed wire on top and these big Hummer vehicles and... and uh, Mercedes, uh, AMGs, and BMWs, and all these high-end vehicles and motorcycles parked out front. And then your curiosity is, what's going on there? Right. So as a salesman, I knocked on the door, and lo and behold, they were a, a, a catalytic converter recycler. Wow. You know, this was like 2007. Right. And uh, come to find out, the, the, the owner of the company grew up in this small West Texas area where I grew up at. And, we were trying to figure out how can we never knew each other. We had some of the same friends in different schools. And <laughs> a small world. So I got in, you know, I was trying to sell him skilled labor, and he called me and said, hey, I need a, a, a marketing director. I need a sales guy. Yeah. Uh, he said, I need a marketing director and do this and that, you know. And and uh, he offered me a job, and, and it was, you know, it's just it's history or sense. That's yeah. good stuff. <laughs> like some interesting here. stories yeah. here. Absolutely. Really some interesting yeah. stories, yeah. But uh, it's uh, you know it's a good business. I always explain this to everybody. It's it's a big business, oh, big absolutely. daughter business. Yeah. It's a uh, it's a small business because everybody knows everybody. Right. You come to the to come to the IPMI and you get to meet you know owners and 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 players from all levels of this industry. And well, there's some know. highly specialized and technical knowledge and skill sets that mm -hmm. are required in this industry. Absolutely, and that's what makes it such a small industry from, a t you know, from a technical ability perspective. So, yeah, mm, it is, it is, and you know, and we know, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's. What's good is, for the most part, and for the majority of the part is, is you have a lot of responsible and ethical people that that are in this industry and this business. Right. You know, just so like that's yeah. a good thing. It is. it is. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing where this uh, catalytic converter uh, committee takes this conversation and, um, you know, future uh, um, developments. 
Um, maybe we can uh, get back together again in the future, maybe at another um, conference. Yeah. Bring yeah, people so up to speed as far as the uh, pro progress is concerned. And, uh, I'm encouraged. I think uh, we've got a good handle on it. I think that it's, it's, it's balanced. It's not, you know, focused on one specific industry that in recycling. Right. Right? It's, it's well balanced from an ethical sourcing perspective. Yeah, I think I think the one message that we should push through the IPMI is, is that if you if you talk to the the big refiners and the banks etc. and you talk about auto catalyst theft, they'll say, "Well, we don't do auto catalyst, so it's not our problem." And but these people need to learn that it is your problem because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if you're refining those ounces, you need to know where it's come from. The banks are going to say, "If I'm financing you, I need to know that you're doing it properly." Correct. So people have got to realise that this isn't just the collector issue. Uh, it's the industry issue. It's not a street okay. issue. No, it's, exactly. it's industry, industry issue. issue. And so they, therefore yeah. the, the banks and the big refiners need to be on board because it's the industry issue. It's not yeah, the, the scrapyards need to be on board with this as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, that's, and, that's, you know, it, it, and that's one thing we're doing as far as the committee. We're actually putting a, like a three-fold, three-fold, tri-fold pamphlet that's going to talk about the... Uh, the auto catalyst recycling, the, the purpose, the need for it, what we're doing as uh, as an industry and everything that way. And it'd be distributed to everybody, it's mem all members of IPMI, that way you can all be on the same page and talking about the same thing. Right. And, you know, when you talk to, uh, uh, whether it's financial institutes or you're talking to legislators, law enforcement, whatever. Education. Yeah. It's, it's, all, it, about it's education. all about education Absolutely. and say, here you go, this is who we are, what we do, and this is what we believe in. And it's all coming from all levels of the industry, and it's uh, that's important. Perfect. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I want to just thank you for your time today and, and your uh, depth of knowledge and your willingness to Thanks share. Thanks for having us. Thanks yeah. Really and important. Thanks and for having congratulations us. to you on your new new branding and your company name as well. Thank you. On, on the committees, that. we appreciate that. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you.